All right, I will get started because I want to respect all of you that have uh, been here on time. And thank you so much for joining. So my name is Tom Hazard. I'm the co-founder of Podatize, along uh, with my co-founder and co-host, business partner, Tracy Hazard. You'll actually see a little picture of her uh, in a little bit. And Tom Poland really wanted to be here today uh, to introduce me. And I got an email very late last night saying that he is really under the weather. Uh, he intended to be on here live to introduce me. And he, he apologized and asked me to extend um, you know, his, his apologies to all of you uh, that he couldn't be here to introduce me. Um, you know, not the end of the world. Obviously, I would have loved it if he could have been here, but he, you know, like I said, he's just not feeling up to it. And as I understand it, it's pretty darn early in the morning in Australia where he is. So on top of not feeling well, to make him get up early in the morning just to introduce me, I thought was a little over the top. Uh, but Tom and I uh, met, we were introduced, I think about four or five months ago. And I've been a guest on his podcast and he has been a guest doing a webinar for what he does to my audience, my community. Uh, and he had been looking for a podcasting expert for a long time and he kept getting recommendations, you know, repeatedly and, and they were all to us, to, to me in particular. And so that's why he wanted me, um, invited me, I guess you should say, to make a presentation to all of you. And uh, I hope you all get something out of this to take away uh, by the end of it. My plan is to go through and talk to you about, you know, why you might want to start a podcast today. And especially in the current situation we're finding ourselves in the world. Um, and then I'm going to go through some key elements or factors, you know, they're Podcasting has been around for a while now, about 15 years, and there is sort of an old school and a new school of podcasting. I'm going to go over some details, I'm not taking too deep a dive into the nitty gritty of, of, you know, details of podcasting, more of a overview and why, you know, you might be interested in podcasting. I'm going to talk about cover art that converts criteria for sound because things have changed. Uh, it's not what it used to be. Um, and then about one of the things I'm really going to focus a bit on is how to maximize your bot power. And, and that really goes to being found. I think you, you probably all remember when you registered that uh, the title of this webinar is how to be found. That's a big part of it. And that is incredibly important, how to be found in a noisy digital world. Um, how are you going to build authority and avoid authority thieves? That's one that you may not realize uh, there are companies out there that you're probably already working with that are really stealing your authority um, it's not that they're doing anything you know wrong per se but it's just in their best interest and not necessarily yours so we'll talk about that and then I want to talk about alternative monetization because what many of you might not realize is you know you do not have to have a podcast with hundreds of thousands or even you know tens of thousands of listeners to make money podcasting and to actually benefit from the process more than just bringing your message to the world. So we'll talk a bit about that. And then I am going to leave some time for questions, probably uh, you know, toward the end. We'll see how quickly I get through uh, my presentation. I, I should have ample time for questions and um, I'm looking forward to that. So. Uh, behind me, you see actually cover arts of a lot of our podcasters. I change this background, you know, about once a year, update it with new cover arts. Um, I am going to share some slides with you. I really don't like putting slides up and hiding myself from the presentation. There are a few slides in the very beginning here that are like that, but I, you know, you're, it's going to be a little more interesting and dynamic, but so uh, on we go. So, you know, why podcast today? Uh, the Binge Factor is actually one of our shows. And one of the things I wanted to share with you is that, yes, we've been podcasting for a long time, myself and uh, my business partner, Tracy. And actually, I'll just go ahead and share with you here. We've been podcasting eh, for, I think, six or seven years now. But we start a new podcast every year because we are in the business of podcasting now. And we need to stay on top of what's working today. 
Uh, so this is myself and Tracy, my co-founder and uh, my business partner. Also, my wife, I will be transparent about that. We are married. Uh, we've been married for 28 years and we've been in business for ourselves almost that same amount of time, not with this business, but multiple businesses. And WTFFF that you see on there was our very first podcast. It's kind of the geeky term FFF for for 3D printing. It was a 3D printing podcast. It's very niche, but it was incredibly popular. And that was where we learned a lot of things about podcasting and developed all our systems that now have become the foundation of Podetize. Uh, we have multiple podcasts, Product Launch Hazards is one really for Amazon sellers. Feed Your Brand is our podcast for podcasters, especially uh, new podcasters. And the binge factor is the one that Tracy has uh, started earlier this year that is the, the latest one. And she interviews top podcasters about what makes their show bingeable. And that one's become incredibly popular and we've learned a lot from it. Um, but, you know, podcasting also led to other things. You see Inc. and BuzzFeed up there. Um, Tracy, through her podcast, became an Inc. columnist and also has a column um, in Authority Magazine, which gets featured on BuzzFeed. So all that came from podcasting. Uh, and it wasn't intentional. It wasn't the goal necessarily. It just happened. So a lot of things can happen from having a podcast. And of course, um, we have been featured in the Harvard Business Review. Um, that's more related to um, physical products. We have been in product design and development for you know most of our careers until Podetize came along, and that's really what the Product Launch Hazards podcast is about. But there are case studies about us and the success we had in business, especially fending off intellectual property, um, you know, threats. Um, you saying I need to be closer? can hardly hear me. I'm so sorry, guys. All right. I'm going to fix that right now. Uh, is that, can you hear Tracy? Is that a little better? Okay, great. I am when, well, we're going to talk about sound quality at some point here. <laughs> and that's a, a very good one to talk about. So um, you'll see when I come back on camera, I'm holding the microphone right in front of my mouth. So we fixed that. All right. So anyway, product launch hazards, that's, you know, our podcast for Amazon sellers and relates more to our earlier careers of product design and development. But now why might you want to start a podcast, especially today, given the context of context of everything going on in our world today? Well, because a lot of your brand messages are never heard and you're having trouble being found, I would suspect. I mean, that was really why I got into podcasting six years ago, is that we were having trouble being found. And even though we had a business and we were in business, you know, just because you have products and services available doesn't mean you're going to be found. We had all this, you know, confusion, all these things clouding our brains as to, all right, you know, how are we going to market ourselves and we decided to experiment with podcasting. And what we found is that in general, in the world we're living in today, it is very hard to be found. Here's a good example. Um, you know, if you Google wedding, LA wedding planners, you get 33 million results on Google. And even in just the city of Los Angeles, there's 20,000 results. So how in the world are you going to stand out in that noisy, crowded digital world? Well, we would suggest podcasting is one really good way that you can do it. And the reason is, well, actually, I guess I should say first, I, I don't know how many of you know, but currently, I'm sure most of you in business have a website because everybody knows, hey, you, you've got to have a website to be a legitimate person or company in business. Well, there's more than one and three quarter billion websites on the internet. And, you know, there are, you know, you say, well, okay, I'm on social media. Well, that's great. You're on social media. And, you know, there are hundreds of millions of YouTube videos and, and YouTube searches that happen. And Google searches are just in the many, many, you know, billions in a day, in a week. I mean, how are you going to be found? Well, podcasts, there are a million total podcasts that have been published. Okay. 
out there that you you can actually find content from, but there's only 300,000 of them that are active, meaning that they are publishing new episodes on a regular basis. And that would be at least monthly, but more likely most of them are publishing weekly and some of them publish several times a week. So 300,000 compared to 1.75 billion websites, it's a much smaller market to be cracking into and it is not too late. Listenership is still going way up at very large double digit growth year over year and even month over month. In fact, um, we have found in uh, the last few months even with, you know, in the United States with COVID-19 and all the stay at home orders, we've seen listenership increase. People have been longing for human connection, especially when they're, you know, forced to work from home and, and not going into an office to interact with people or not traveling in, at business events. So unless you had had a podcast that was in like the genre of sports, uh, talking about, you know, and, you know, Monday morning quarterbacking type of shows or talking about what's happening in the basketball markets or football or baseball, those podcasts certainly saw a, a steep decline in listenership because they don't have as much to talk about. But other than that, we've seen a significant increase. And what we're talking about is using podcasting as part of a power platform. You know, I mentioned social media a little while ago. You know, if you are trying to get um, exposure for your brand, for your business by, you know, posting things on, on social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, your average post will get seen by you know, a very small percentage, usually, you know, one and a half percent of your followers. And then if you're, you know, doing other forms of exposure, maybe advertising, and, and I'm talking about conversion, people seeing it and also, you know, converting to click and find out more on, you know, YouTube, or if you're doing Google pay-per-click, you get a conversion sometimes of, you know, thir up to 13%. And in podcasting, and that's the icon on the right, is our symbol for podetize, you know, we're finding, you see that our, our uh, podcasters are seeing conversion to, you know, calls to action, meaning people responding to a call to action, clicking a link, going to a landing page to find out more from something you post on social media or from something you talk about within your podcast episode itself is usually between 30 and 40%, you know, for a conversion to call to action. So that's why we're talking about, you know, the importance and, and the benefits of podcasting and building a whole platform around that. Now, podcasting is not the be all and end all. It's wonderful. I love it. And you can build a really loyal audience of raving fans, build a community that's waiting to hear from you in your next episode. But even the, the you know, one of the things I want to talk about is the old school versus the new school of podcasting. It used to be you could just launch a podcast that put you on the map, which it still does to a large extent, but that you could just have that podcast and not need to do anything else with it. Well, that was about 10 years ago. Now, if you don't take advantage of that podcast and multicast it and use it in other mediums across social media and your own website, and we're going to talk about these things today, you're really leaving a lot of opportunity on the table and won't get the best return on your time and or money invested in launching a podcast. So let's talk about old school versus new school. Uh, I'm, I bet many of you may have read or heard in, uh, you know, the media in the last couple of months about Joe Rogan. This is Joe Rogan and his podcast. He, his podcast got purchased by Spotify for a three-year deal reportedly about a hundred million dollars. That is the extreme outlier of podcasters. Okay. He, um, it's really, I'm, I'm saying here, it's all about me. It's all about Joe Rogan. Yes. He started his show about 12 years ago, built it up over a long period of time. He is the attraction. He's the talent. It is really all about him. And of course, discussions he has with people, guests he has on all that sort of thing. Um, he is the, you know, one hundredth of 1% of podcasters that succeed 
in that way, making money through advertising because he has millions of listeners. And that's great. I'm glad that's, you know, Joe has succeeded. Good for him. And it's great for the podcast industry because it makes people more aware of it and interested in, you know, becoming podcast listeners. But I am here to tell you the new school of podcasting is that it's not about you. And this is one of the things that, you know, we work with a lot of different podcasters. Uh, we produce podcasts for over 400 podcasters and growing every week. And we always tell them, especially when they're starting a new show, you know, you need to serve first. You got to make this about the listener and what's in it for them and not focus so much on it being all about you. Um, and, you know, there's a, a great quote, you know, um, my business partner, Tracy, she took uh, Dale Carnegie back in the early 90s, I think it was, as a part of her uh, beginning of her career. And, you know, Dale Carnegie has this great quote, you know, that you can, what's the matter? Oh. Noise? Well, let's switch. Why don't we switch microphones then? Did you get me another one? Sorry, guys. Thank you for the feedback. We'll, we'll switch mics here. Okay. Well, can you just take, take it out of the stand for me? Oh, okay. Okay. I got it. All right. Pardon me, guys. Bear with me one second. I'm going to switch mics. I'm just going to make sure the new one is set properly and picking up. And then, Tracy, I want you to give me some feedback or have people chime in. Hold on. I got to make sure it's now on the right one. Okay. Now I'm on the, um, now I'm on the new mic. Uh, how's that sounding? Do you think I need to hold it in my hand again or is it good where it is? How about that? A little better? I'll just pull it closer. All right. Oh, is that the problem? Because I'm holding it and moving it. All right. Not in a stand. Sorry guys. I was trying to move it closer to my mouth. All right. Are we good to continue? You think? All right. All right. So anyway, I was talking about Dale Carnegie. He has a great quote that you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people to be interested in you. And this just reinforces the idea that it's not about you. It's, you know, you, when you're podcasting, while we all want to benefit from it for our business, no question. And there are tremendous benefits. We're going to talk about them. But you want to make sure you're serving first you're focused on what's in it for the listener, what's in it for them, and serve them. And then the law of reciprocity kicks in. This is the new school of podcasting, okay? That you serve first, but then you're going to, you know, market, lead, generate all of us in business, either as solopreneurs or as, you know, small business owners or even large businesses, usually have the same needs. And that is to be found. We've got these products or services then we're, we're experts in our niche, but the world doesn't know it. We know it. And some of our friends and family and close business contacts know it, but the world doesn't know it. And that's where podcasting comes in. So continuing along the idea that it's not all about you, I wanted to share some podcast cover arts that these are examples, and I'm always nervous. If any of you are here on this webinar, uh, I apologize in advance. I, I know it's going to happen someday. I, I haven't you know, had it happen yet. But these are examples I'm suggesting for what not to do. And actually, the one that I'm in here, that's, that's not actually my cover art. That's, that's somebody else's. But all of these people, I mean, when you look at these different shows, like take five-minute marketing, you know, I understand the desire to put your face on it for authenticity to say, Hey, I'm, this is my podcast. I stand behind it. I am being authentic and real and I'm putting my face on it. I, I get that initial thought, but quite honestly, this five minute marketing podcast, I, I, this guy doesn't look old enough to really be a marketing expert, you know, and five minute marketing. Am I really going to get, from this guy, does he have a lot of experience? Am I going to get a lot of valuable insights in marketing in five minutes anyway? I just, uh, to me, this cover art and a lot of these are, are not helping the podcaster be heard because people, 
you know, human nature is people tend to like people like themselves. And when, when you put your face up there, if whoever is, you know, searched on something in your genre, your podcast has come up in the app. If you look very different from them, you know, they may just disqualify themselves and move on. No, I, you know, I don't relate to that person. It, it can do you more harm than good. So uh, for a number of reasons, especially that we always say, get your face off your cover art. We don't recommend that. And I'm going to give you some examples here of, of cover art that we would suggest per, serves you much better. And it actually ends up serving your community better because it becomes the, the cover art becomes less about you and more about what's in it for them. So, you know, as an example here, let's see. Um, yep. Let me get that one. So the successful thinker. Now, while you may not know everything about what this podcast is about, it's a really engaging image. The, you know, the message is, is clear. If you were searching on search criteria that brought up this podcast, you might give it a click and give it a listen. Uh, here's another one by Penny Zenker called Take Back Time. Well, I'm interested in that. Who doesn't need more time in their lives to either accomplish their goals or to, you know, have more leisure time? This cover is very engaging and very clear as to, you know, why you might want to click. And it, you know, there's a reason why the voice, you know, TV show that they don't let the professional musicians see who is going to um, see who's singing because they don't want them to make a decision on anything other than the quality of their voice. I suggest the same thing really helps you in podcasting. I'm not joking. This is a great cover art. Um, Dr. Peter McGraw, actually, this was sort of created with his likeness, but it's not him, right? The abstracting it. This is one way you can use your likeness and get away with it. And the last one I'm going to share with you is a good example of a very clear cover art, passive real estate investing. I think this comes across very, very quickly as to what it's about and why you might want to listen. People give it a click. This is a very popular top ranked show on Apple and, um, it's just a weekly podcast. Marco Santorelli has been doing it for about five years and he's in all the top ranked uh, shows. So, you know, cover art that attracts is very important. And, you know, uh, we would, uh, of course, obviously not recommend having your face on it. All right. So now I'm going to address the elephant in the room and talk about sound quality. <laughs> Ironic that I had a little sound quality issue. I'm sorry about that, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, so here's the thing. Again, a little old school versus new school. It used to be in the beginning of podcasting around 2005, people would prefer to go into a recording studio and really, you know, especially people that came from radio, sort of the old school of radio, a terrestrial radio, you know, they're accustomed to soundproof booths, really you know, large microphones, mixing boards, engineers, processing the sound as you're recording. And I'm here to tell you, it's not that complicated. Okay. Uh, technology's improved so much, despite my tech issues today with one microphone. Uh, technology has gotten so much better that you do not need to go into a recording studio. You do not need thousands of dollars of equipment a literally a hundred to hundred and fifty dollar microphone is all you need in most situations. There are maybe are some unique situations where you might want a little bit of an upgraded equipment, but we're talking hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. And it really depends more. The reason you'd need more is if you're going to record more people in person with you in the same room. But if you're recording either only yourself or you're going to be interviewing guests remotely in different locations using a tool like Zoom. We're using Zoom webinar today. Zoom has become a very high quality software for you to be able to connect with people remotely and record podcasts. I wanna say the majority of our podcasters, literally many hundreds are using Zoom to record all their episodes. Zoom has really improved in the last 18 months. And look, there are other programs and I have no problem with other recording programs. There are other good ones also. But if you're recording video and audio, or even if it's just audio, even if it's just audio using Zoom, it has some technical capability 
that allows for higher quality recording and editing and output of your media. And the other thing to note is that, you know, the MP3 files are the medium that the podcast ecosystem uses. And there are some quality limitations of MP3 files. The reason they use MP3 is they download really quickly and, and they stream quickly. So distribution and when people play them, getting it in an instant is really important. Um, so it's, it's a compressed file format. So um, there's only a certain quality level that's, that they're capable of anyway. So you can overpay on equipment and you know do this beautiful raw recordings but the reality is by the time it gets compressed and output you sort of lose whatever advantage you would have gained from that higher quality professional equipment uh, that's my opinion um, and my experience so but also in terms of quality sound professional criteria for sound you have a couple other things to consider and that is your environment you're recording in now i mentioned you don't have to go into a recording studio anymore and that's true but it is important that you consider your space you're recording in and you do some test recordings and listen to it. Uh, Cause if you're going to be in a room that has an awful lot of hard surfaces, hardwood floors, windows, you know, very high ceilings that create a lot of echo, you're going to be really disappointed um, with the quality of your sound and your listeners probably will too. It's always best to have a, you know, to be intentional about it. I'm not saying you have to create a dedicated space or spend a lot of money outfitting a dedicated space. There are bootstrap ways, low budget ways to do it and produce tremendously wonderful sound. There really are. But it's just being intentional and thinking about it. More soft surfaces, a room that has wall-to-wall -wall carpet would be friendlier to recording good sound than one with hardwood floors. If there are windows in a room, if you can pull drapes across them, then you know that's preferable so that the sound doesn't bounce off the window and create echo. There are things that we can do in editing a podcast in post-production, but um, we're limited in that capability. And also when we travel on the road, when we were traveling and we will all travel again, recording in a hotel room is not a bad environment. Just make sure the air conditioning is turned off while you do it so you don't have a machine noise and all the carpet and the bedding and the drapes across the windows acoustically, it's a, it's a great environment actually to record in. So, um, so I just wanted to share that and, and just to spell any myths, if you thought, oh my gosh, in order to record a podcast, I need to go into a studio and have all this expensive equipment, you really don't. Okay, so now I wanna move on to actually what's one of my favorite subjects regarding podcasting and that's getting bot worthy and by bots i mean ai intelligence search engines the, and here's where we get to probably what you wouldn't have expected to hear about podcasting because again it's a powerful medium on its own you, people you're in you're speaking in their ears every week usually and they get to like you they believe they know you even though they've never met you you have a lot of power there you become an authority to them but are they gonna find you? Now, if they're already a podcast and they're searching for podcasts in your subject area, hopefully they'll come across your podcast, but what else can we do? What we want to do is tap into what we call verbal SEO. And this has become a much bigger thing in the last couple of years than, than it was even before. And we've been doing this and tapping into verbal SEO for more than five years with what we've been doing with Podetize. But verbal SEO also because of the smart speakers, the Google Homes of the world, the Alexas, uh, Siri, the natural voice patterning of what we say when we search with these devices is really important. And it just so happens that podcasting is very much in alignment with this use of speech to search and you can be found better. Now we syndicate all our podcasters on about 14 different podcast apps and platforms so that you are on the Amazon Alexa and the Google Home and, and um, you know, you're picked up by Siri uh, in a number of different ways. So that's important, but we're also talking about more than just the podcast because if you leave the podcast it, as an audio show only and you leave it in the app, you're actually helping Apple 
you're helping Spotify, you're helping Stitcher, you're helping Google Podcasts, any of these platforms, in a lot, a lot of times you're helping them more than you're helping yourself. What we always want to do with our content is drive people off of that app and onto our own website. And you know, even if you're also putting your podcast out as video, and about 40% of our customers do that, if, especially if they're recording in Zoom anyway, it's pretty easy to you know, edit and put that out as a video on YouTube. And we do recommend doing that if you're recording video anyway, definitely. But again, if you put that on YouTube, you're helping YouTube. So you want to bring everybody home to your own website. Your own website is a critical part of your platform. And what we recommend for all podcasters is that every episode be converted into a comprehensive blog post and put on your website based on what was said in the episode. It starts as a transcript, but it doesn't end that it end as a transcript. We, you know, we do base the blog post on what was said, but it gets cleaned up, quality improved, made easier to read. But it's still, for the most part, what was said in the episode. And what Google does is then the bots, they scan that post and they associate all these phrases that are contained within it that you said in your episode or your guests said in your episode that match up with what people are searching in Google search bar for every day. And as huge as podcasting is and as powerful a medium as it is, and I love it, I really do, and it's changed my life, but the reality is there are still uh, millions more people every month searching and you know, I would say tens of millions, even it may even be billions. I may be understating this, but that are searching on Google first. That's their go-to for where, when they have a need or desire, a pain point. And if it's a pain point or a need, they may be searching at two or three in the morning, but they're going to Google first. So how do you get found for that? It's by having this blog post that is the text version of your podcast and that's how you get found your website gains very critical equity of keyword phrase rankings in google search and then gets unique visitors from google search coming to your website every month our average podcaster working with us as long as they've been doing it for 25 to 50 episodes maybe more towards the 50 so that's about a year if you're doing um you know one a week they are getting about 10,000 unique visitors to their website every month from Google search. And we have podcasters well north of that, 50,000 and more unique visitors to their website every month. So your website needs to be the home base for your show, your center of influence, and where you want to drive all your traffic to. And that's very important for monetization when we get to that in just a couple of minutes. The other thing that I wanna share with you is, you know, Podcast content can be put everywhere. Now, this is a little graphic where we show all the different places that we syndicate podcasts to. These are all different apps or platforms or websites. Um, and, you know, if you're, especially if you're doing video and audio, and you don't have to do video, and you certainly don't have to do it from the beginning. But if you, you have more places to put out that content if you also do video. But we are multicasting our customers' content to all these places. And we all want to be on all these platforms and should be. However, many of them are also what we call authority thieves. Because here's the thing, remember I said before, if you leave it as a podcast, if you leave it as an audio file, or if you also leave it as a video in YouTube, and you don't utilize your website, you don't convert that content to that written form, then you're helping those other platforms. And the reality is, they are interested in your content not to help you be found. They're interested in your content to help their platform be more meaningful, and for other, you know, the consumers of the content to think of their platform as the go-to place. So authority thieves, you got to be really careful of. And, you know, if you do have done any research and know a little bit about podcasting, you might know that you might understand that all podcasts need to be hosted on the internet, as well as, um, you know, just like websites are, they have to be hosted 
because you know Apple doesn't keep your MP3 files in their system. They're a directory, just a middleman. And there are some podcast hosting platforms that also try to steal your authority. They say, oh, we give you a free web page. You don't need to have a web page on your website, or you don't need to have a website at all for your podcast. You have one on our platform. Well, you can do that, but again, that web page is honestly benefiting them more than it is you uh, because it's driving traffic to their website, not yours. So remember I talked earlier about a power plat having a platform, right? These four main components of a platform that help you build authority and actually convert all these listeners and viewers of your content. It's, you, you got to be Google searchable, which means a website. Now, when it comes to a website, we recommend WordPress as the platform. Um, there are obviously other platforms out there for a website, but in our experience, none perform as well for having you be found. And I'm talking about getting those keyword rankings and traffic than WordPress. So we do recommend a WordPress website and they haven't paid us to say that. That's just our experience. You need to be putting out content on a regular basis. And you know what? You could blog the conventional way, but it's a lot harder. It takes a lot more hours to write a blog post that's three or 4,000 words long than it would take you to speak it, which would take about 20 to 30 minutes to speak it, an episode of about that length. And then, of course, sharing everything everywhere on all the platforms, but everything links back to your site, your site's home base. That, that blog post becomes a resource for all your listeners and also attracts people from Google. So you want to make sure when they get there, they can listen to it. We're talking about being convenient and having your, all your podcasts be everywhere. People are looking for it. Now, like I said, you don't have to do video. Uh, we didn't when we first started a podcast like more than six years ago, um, but it became uh, more and more important to do more and more video. And we do a lot more video now than we used to. We're, we're putting out most of our podcast episodes as video, but going to audio, to blog, to social, when you create this blog and we create unique graphics for every episode, you have a lot more material to push out on social media. And that all helps build your authority. And it also builds trust. Um, so I'm gonna, I wanna talk about trust for a second. You know, your podcast, it becomes a, a channel of content. And like I mentioned, you know, Tracy started The Binge Factor earlier this year, and it's, it's really um, become very popular very quickly. And it is continuing to build her authority, and she has this partnership with uh, Authority Magazine and Buzzsprout, where a lot of those interviews become articles that go out on that platform. Oh, BuzzFeed, not Buzzsprout. Yeah, BuzzFeed. Sorry, guys. Wrong platform. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, I want to, when you, when you have a trusted channel, it then, even though it's for them, it starts to become about you too. You become this authority and then people naturally that it, you show you care, you build integrity, you show that you are an expert in your field, all that builds trust. And then now you have all kinds of opportunities to monetize. Now, remember I said just the very, very minority of podcasts can be attractive to big name sponsors that are going to pay lots of money every month. And, and that's true. Now you can build one that way. And we do have podcasters that do, you know, we have they're not maybe making their entire living on the advertising of the show, but we got podcasts that are making, you know, anywhere from several thousand dollars a month to maybe even 10,000 a month. Sometimes a special series, you get a sponsor who will for 25 episodes pay you maybe between 15 or $30,000. These things do happen. Okay. I don't want to minimize the fact that they happen, but the, the way to monetize a podcast more quickly it are you got to think about monetization a little different way. If we're all in business in some way, either as solopreneurs, small business owners, or, or in, you know, larger business, we have products, services, maybe courses, um, and we have books, uh, we have consulting that we want to, you know, do with people and whether you sell it by the hour or it's a bigger package, you, if you're in business, you're in business to sell something and you should have something to sell. Podcasting, all this content creation and putting it out there 
helps you be found and then you can make offers to your audience for, you know, it can be initially, maybe it's something free of value you're going to give them that maybe gets them into the very top of a funnel, perhaps. And this is just rudimentary, you know, um, representation of a funnel, but that like, know, and trust can convert to buy at a much higher rate. Remember I said, podcast calls to action, we see conversion rates for calls to action between 30 and 40%. And what that means is you have a promotion in your audio episode saying, hey, if you're you know, interested to learn more, go to my website and, and take our little quiz assessment. See if you're a good fit for this service or for what we do or or go and get this white paper or get a free chapter of my book or get this chart or graph maybe it's an infographic could be a number of different things but whatever it is you you know i had this happen recently with uh one of our podcasters who um he is a a um, a stroke victim and he has recovered from stroke for you know 10 years now i mean it's, it's a long time ago and he is an authority on stroke hacking, how to recover from it, from a medical perspective, from a uh, occupational therapy perspective, just how to live and cope with life after stroke. And he has a podcast. He's been doing, you know, building a nice audience with his podcast, but he was struggling for how to monetize. And it, this is literally just two months ago, I think, in the middle of COVID-19. And, you know, he was feeling a little pain like everybody was about, you know, uh, like a lot of people were with, you know, decreased revenue as a result of, of stay-at-home orders. And I said to him, well, you are an authority and people do look to you for advice and, and counsel, but right now you're giving it all away for free. Now, I do agree you have to give on your podcast openly and freely initially. You've got to serve first. But you just can give people, you know, some information there. You, you don't give one-on-one -on -one consulting there and, and a D, take a deeper dive into somebody's individual needs. So why don't you offer not only a, a weekly group coaching call that people could pay maybe $49 a month for, or, you know, if you think you can charge $99 a month, do that and get a group of people and then serve them in a live group coaching call once a week. Or the upgrade from that is they can sign up for a half an hour with you for $250, or maybe it's an hour for $350 or $400, whatever it is. And this was like, you know, he, he was like really ostrich. So like, oh my gosh, you're right. I, I, there are people who would pay that. I could be doing that. So he didn't have to do too much to figure out how to monetize. Okay. But again, you caring about people, showing integrity, providing value, translates to trust through podcasting. And I see this all the time. We'll have people walk up to us at events. Of course, when we were going to events, but we'd have people walk up to us and say, hey, I, I listen to your show. And, and they, they come up to you and talk to you. And, and, and they're so familiar with you. At first, it's, it seems a little stalkery. It's a little scary. Because you're like, well, how do you know me? And then you realize, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm on a podcast. And I do those videos. Of course, you know me. Um, but they, they believe they already know you. So it breaks down a lot of barriers to doing business with you organically, which is the magic of podcasting. So, um, so alternative monetization, just don't underestimate being found and selling what you already have, selling more of what you do. And honestly, there are just dozens and dozens of different ways to monetize a podcast as long as you're in business and also to come up with free lead generation items to be able to, to, you know, attract people and get them into that first step to take that first step and get off of that app over to your website, identify themselves and want to engage with you. So that's, that's just the wonderful thing about podcasting. Now, another thing I want to share before I get to, um, we're going to get to some questions here really quick. I'm just going to take another couple minutes and then open it up. Uh, but what I want to let you know is, let's say you find this fascinating or you're at least remotely interested in it, but you're not sure if starting a podcast is really the perfect fit for you. I mean, many of you, hopefully it is, or, or you know, you have interest in that. But let's just say not ready for that quite yet. We've come up with a new program 
which is a podcast guesting program. Because the other thing you can do is just draft off other people's podcasts and go on as a guest to other shows. So we have actually a new program, not just becoming a podcaster, but really diving into podcast guesting. And you don't get all of the same advantages, but you can get an awful lot of them and not have to worry about, all right, I, I have to continue to record some more episodes this month to fill, you know, one a week or whatever. Um, you do have to spend time being a guest on other shows, but there are other people's shows. So you can still build some authority. Uh, there is a blog post component and, and we actually can create a podcast out on iTunes of your interviews, your appearances on other shows you know, podcasters are all too happy to have you rebroadcast the show that you were interviewed on. And you, we can put that and take a collection of them, you know, at least a dozen, but we would recommend up to 25 over a period of time, going and being systematic guests on different shows. And then you can put out a podcast feed, share it with your, you know, followers and get more exposure for that. Uh, for who you are and what you do or what your company's about without having to start your own podcast. So that's another thing I just wanted to mention that's available. And then uh, I wanted to also share with you that uh, let's say you're interested in this, but you're on a bootstrap and there's got to be some of you out there, I'm sure that are on a really tight budget and maybe have had a decrease in revenue uh, this year because of COVID-19. If that's you, then I would invite you to go to podatize.com forward slash bootcamp. We have a free bootcamp. It, it, it did used to, we used to charge people $500 for this bootcamp, but when COVID-19 happened with the stay at home orders, we made it free uh, because we just thought more people were in need. We had a lot more inquiries and interest. And so we made it free. So you're welcome to go to that. It is a seven hour series of videos with downloads and handouts. If you want to learn how to start, how to launch a successful podcast on your own, we go through the nitty gritty detail and take you all through it. So I'd invite you to do that. But if you're interested in talking about, um, you know, working with us to take you through our done for you program, or even just to have a discussion about it, or if you're interested in that podcast guesting opportunity that I mentioned, go to podatize.com forward slash inquiry, or you can even just go to the homepage and scroll down about three quarters of the way down is my booking calendar where you can book a 30 minute call with me. And we can look at your platform, understand your business, see where you're at, make some recommendations and see if it's a good fit for you. So um, hopefully you noted that I can um, maybe Tracy, you can put those two links in the chat because I've taken it off the screen. And at this point also, let's see if we have uh, any, any questions. any questions. Okay. Let's have it. So very good question. Yes. Now in most cases, it, what's that? Oh, I should repeat the question. I'm sorry. Of course you can't hear Tracy saying that question. How silly of me. Okay. So uh, the question was, um, you know, I am a podcaster and, you know, if I'm going to take my face off my cover art, um, it was a question regarding how do you incorporate, you know, your brand, your, either your personal brand or your company brand into the podcast, into the name. So here's, here's the thing. Uh, rarely would we recommend that the podcast name be the same as a company name. Uh, your podcast brand, though, should be an extension of or an ingredient of your bigger either personal brand or corporate brand, uh, business brand. And let's talk about, you know, the podcast name and the cover art. I, I want to talk about a little differently. They're two different things, okay? And I know they're related and the name is on the cover art and it should be. Um, but your cover art, is a visual experience. People are going to see it because they're either browsing through a category of podcasts like business marketing or, or business investing or, you know, or, or self-help or there's all sorts of categories in podcast apps. And then it'll serve up different arts, uh, different cover arts. 
And the job of that cover art is to grab someone's visual attention and get them to click to find out more. It's a visual attraction. Say, whoa, that looks interesting. What's that about? Let me click and see. That's one thing. Now, some people are more visual. Other people are more intellectual and would read before they you know, look at the cover art. And so that's where the name needs to attract and do the same thing. So uh, I like uh, the idea of the name. Um, Tracy, what was that name that was, can I see it here? Overcome anxiety and depression. Now, what I like about that is it's very clear as to who it's for. Um, now, there's not as much about who you are. So, yes, I would say with host name or brought to you by this business name if you want. Although, you know, I would say host name is better because people want to relate to you as an individual. But certainly, they're all, you also have an opportunity, remember, with your podcast listing to have a subtitle. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the cover art, but remember the cover art gets displayed and then there's text with the name of the show. And if they click, they get the name of the show, they get a subtitle and they get the description. And it's in the subtitle and description, we can get a little more specific and granular about um, what the show's about, who it's for, why somebody would want to click and listen. Uh, but brand wise, yeah, um, I, I'm all for putting your name out there as the host or with, I mean, we do that with our shows and binge factor with Tracy hazard or hosted by Tracy hazard. And, you know, but it, it does not say sponsored by Podetize. I want to make that clear. It, it is its own thing. And if people go to Podetize, they learn about the binge factor. They're definitely related. Uh, but we don't scream out there the corporate name, you know, because you don't want to appear to be too salesy or commercial. You want, like you said, remember, you want to serve first. So what's in it for them? But a little bit of credibility, why you, is important too. That gets more in the description, but putting your name there, I think is important. I hope that answered the question. What else? Do you think podcasts are a relevant avenue for nonprofits? And it's ah, okay. So the question is, do I think that, uh, podcasts are relevant for nonprofits, and if so, what was that? If so, what, do you think the approach should what should the approach be? Okay, so uh, I do think they're relevant for nonprofits. We have several nonprofits that uh, we are podcasting podcasting with us, and uh, while they usually have kind of tight or limited budgets, it's definitely serving them to raise awareness for their charity and help their charity rise above the crowd of all the others that are also asking for donations or trying to serve their community. So um, it's very relevant because it, it, it helps people relate. You're, you're providing uh, a valuable um, service and outreach to your community. Uh, and, and that's what we find most often. So I'm trying to think journey's dream is one of the nonprofits that we work with. And there's another, there's several, I'm, I'm sorry guys. So I have, we just have like 400 plus podcasters we're working with. So it's sometimes I don't always remember the names, but definitely, um, it's very relevant because it doesn't matter whether you're your business entity is a for-profit endeavor or a non-profit endeavor. You, you probably have the same needs and that's being found, being heard, uh, raising awareness for your mission. And people consume podcast content of all varying kinds of um, of information and in all subject areas. So it, I, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that there isn't a listening audience for you, for your nonprofit. I hope that makes sense. So, you know, my approach would be, you know, as long as you have a, uh, something to say, you have a message you want to bring to the world to either serve your community or to, um, to serve your community or, or to just, again, you know, keep your donors engaged might be another thing. It could be outreach to uh, ask for donations. I mean, think about PBS uh, or, or not, P yeah, PBS like telethons or, or NPR radio. I mean, they still do donation drives. They're providing valuable content for a community at the same time they're reaching out to people through that medium to support the organization. And the more they like your content, the more they want to support it. So, I mean, to me, that's all in alignment. And uh, would be very successful. And we're seeing it with some other nonprofits. Sorry, I don't remember 
some of the others, but we definitely, the, the, you're not unique in thinking about this. Do we have any other questions? Um, we have, um, should we put the weight by weight of the podcast on our website? So far I've been putting my Yushka link onto my website. Am I doing it the wrong way? Okay, so if your link, this is a good question. I'm sorry, I better repeat the question. Somebody's asking, should they put the actual, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not, I'm gonna use different language, the actual recording of their episode on their website, or should they have a link for people to go listen to it somewhere else, as I think sort of what that was meaning. Would you agree? Yeah, okay. Absolutely have I'll put it on your website in a way people can listen to it there without leaving your website. Absolutely no ifs, ands, or buts about that. If you are just providing a link for people to go listen somewhere else you're doing that other platform a favor and you are minimizing your relevance to that listener. The more time they spend on your website, the better off you will be for your brand, for retention. But it's, it's um, you know, you don't have to actually put the recording like the WAV file or the MP3 file on the site for people. It went, when you have a podcast, you have a host that is serving that remember i said apple doesn't keep your recordings in their system they're a middleman they're going to go request it and download it or stream it from your media host from your podcast host so the reality is your podcast host you can get uh, for every episode a file link that embeds in your website and it will stream it from your media host to your website and what that means is you have a list of all your episodes on the site you press play button and they're listening actively but they're staying on your website so now you have more opportunity to be more relevant to these listeners now most people if they're new podcast listeners they'll listen on the website then later on they will say all right i want to subscribe and listen regularly they're going to go to their phone or figure out what app they have they can listen on they'll probably subscribe there and that's fine you you want that you know, they don't have to always come back to your website to listen. The, the idea of playing on the website is when people find you new, when people find you new um, and they want to listen to your content from Google search, they come to a blog post, there's always a track player right there. They can listen before they go anywhere else. Keep them on your website and you'll be more relevant to them and you have more opportunity to capture them. Maybe get them to opt into your list, uh, whether it's an email list or, you know, whatever other kind of free lead magnet you might use to engage with them and, uh, and in, you sort of um, get them to identify themselves to you. So you can then have them as part of your community, reach out to them, retarget them, make them offers. Uh, anything else, Tracy? Okay. So yes. So questions come up about replays. So yeah, I have recorded this and we will make this available uh, for you. Uh, how are we going to do that? Uh, we, did we, did we plan that? I think we have everybody's contact info from zoom so we can send you all an email uh, as to where you can watch the replay and what's that? It'll probably, yeah, that's right. We'll probably put it on YouTube. I, I'm sorry, guys. I hadn't thought through some of that detail to, to share with you. It's a good question because this, uh, this is Tom's, you know, list that when he's invited us to share with your group, so uh, for his group. So anyway, uh, we'll probably put it in YouTube and then we will email you um, with that link. And we, you know what? We also have a feed your brand group on Facebook, we can also post it there. So keep in mind, feed your brand. Uh, there you go. So I see a couple more questions in the Q&A, yeah, Trace. So I want to create a podcast with different types of episodes, okay. short solo, short interviews, the long form, and the other stuff on my Instagram. Yes. So, uh, so the question from Al McBride about, I want to create a podcast with different types of episodes, short solo, short interviews, and long form interviews. Is that a good idea to have it all under the same banner or separate it out? I would, that's a really good question. As long as the subject matter, the niche, the genre, and the audience, the, the listeners would be the same for all those kind of episodes, do it in one podcast. You will actually build an audience faster, having more episodes, more content, and varying kinds of content is just fine. And we've, we've done that. And, and, 
you know, you'd also don't have to keep doing that consistently for years, you know, or even months. You can pivot different kind of episodes you do. And, you know, we've done it a number of times, pivoted, you know, the kind of episodes. My first podcast, we did five episodes a week, one long format interview and four short answering a question of a listener type episodes. And we did that for almost a year, I, I believe. And then we dialed it back and changed the format a little bit and did, you know, uh, I think four or three episodes a week of different kinds, different themes, but all still to the same audience around the same general subject matter. And um, so you could definitely do that. The only reason you'd want to split it off into a couple different shows is if there's a really different focus or different audience and you can do that, but you can still have the same website. I also want to mention to be the home for both of those shows. Don't feel like you have to have a different website for each show. That's a, that would be a mistake because you build more uh, authority with your website, regardless of what content is living there. All right. And then what mic am I using? It sounds good. Great. Thank you. It is straight USB into zoom. So I use um, an Audio Technica microphone. We, um, we stock these for especially our customers that are launching a podcast. Um, and it's called an um, a AT2005. Now we also have a microphone that we have developed, which is beside me here in the, in the image, which is a self-recording microphone. So especially for people that are on the road a lot and you're, you know, or even doing YouTube videos and you want to have better quality audio, but you, you want to record the audio separately. If you're on location for interviews and you don't want to carry all, all other equipment or have a computer you're plugging it into, this microphone records to an SD card right in the microphone. Now, um, I'm sorry to say because of COVID-19, our production is delayed. Um, so this is coming uh, later this year in 2020. Uh, I don't have an exact date yet. Um, so, uh, but it is in development. And, uh, but for now, Audio Technica 2005 uh, is what I would recommend. You may have a hard time finding it. There's been a run on microphones during COVID-19. I mean, Honestly, more new podcasters have decided this is the time to launch their shows. And they're right. It is a perfect time. So we have, um, these microphones have been in short supply and we've had to um, have some, we've had to buy some comparable but slightly different models, same technical capabilities. Uh, Audio Technica is what I would go with as a go-to regardless, um, what, regardless of what model you can find. And 30 pounds, What's 30 pounds? No, no, the price. <laughs> oh, 30 pounds. Oh, if you're, uh, yeah, if that's your currency. Um, I've, you know, pre-COVID-19, these microphones, you could get them for 80 US dollars. Um, honestly, then it went up to 99 and we're seeing short, they're in such short supply, you can buy them new, but sometimes only with a bundle with some other equipment that you may or may not need. Uh, seeing them as high as like $129. Um, that may be the price you have to pay if you have to get one. Yes. Okay, Michael, what's the question? Let me see. I can lead it. You are, re are you recording your podcasts now via Zoom for audio and video? Yes, I am. Uh, honestly, we, there are many different tools. We've tried them all. We've reviewed them all. I find Zoom to be the simplest, easiest, and, and, perfectly good quality to use and it's gotten better over the last two years so we use zoom do you use multiple cameras um so i do have oh thank you i'm going to show you what we use for a camera uh in fact there's another one of these up here that's external camera um i you know what i'm going to plug it in only because i'm going to show you one of the features it has which isn't so great for me because i have glasses but it also has a ring light, uh, you know, a vanity light built into it. And this is a, like a $56 USB camera. It's an HD camera. It's on Amazon. Um, we can put the link to it um, in the email we send with the replay video if you want. Um, but it's not that I think this is the be all end all camera. It's a very good one for sure. Uh, and I like it. Uh, it's, it's compact. Um, so I use an external camera because my experience has been, and honestly, this computer I'm on right now was brand new in February. And I thought, Oh, great. A new computer. It's a Mac. It's going to have a better camera than my Mac that was seven years old was no, it was no better. In fact, I found it to be a little worse. So, um, I, I use an external USB camera, uh, for the quality. 
and I don't use multiple cameras, <coughs> but if you're really into that, you can. I mean, I guess I should say, it's not that I never do. We do have other video cameras not connected to the internet for streaming, but when we have done a boot camp, like if any of you go to the podtize.com forward slash boot camp and take that, you're gonna see that video while it was recorded live, all those videos. There are multiple camera angles and shots on us. We did three cameras plus a fourth that was streaming it live when we did it uh, live. And that's so that we could edit it and create a much more dynamic video. This this video presentation you saw me do today, which you know, I'm my position is moving. I'm overlaid over slides, and you know, I'm 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 doing some different things. That's a different software we weren't using back then. Uh, just trying to make a more dynamic presentation that's more interesting. Like I said, I don't like always sort of being off camera, hiding behind the slides when I'm having slides going. It's just not so interesting. So we will get you the link to the camera, Michael, or oh, you're doing it now, Tracy. All right. Well, we buy everything pretty much on Amazon. And so Tracy just uh, pasted the link there. So, um, and we have multiples of them. The other thing, I don't know, I I'm, I'm willing to keep talking if you guys have questions. I don't really have anywhere I need to be quickly. So, um, you know, if I can provide you value, I'm happy to do that. Uh, if you're going to do video, then, um, I really do think a green screen is very helpful and behind me is a green screen. That's how I'm able to, um, you know, do some of these things. And um, it just, if you're going to do video, remember I talked earlier with your audio, this is true. This what I said then is also true about video. If you're going to do video, just be intentional about it. Don't be random about it. I'm not saying you have to have a professional video camera. You, you use a webcam just like I'm using right now, perfectly acceptable. You know, it doesn't take a lot of expensive equipment to produce high quality video that people are gonna appreciate. So, um, but be intentional about it. Now, if you wanna do a green screen, that's great. I mean, you can paint a wall green behind you if you have a dedicated space, you wanna do that. I have a roller shade green screen that's attached uh, to the ceiling overhead and I pull it down when I need it and I put it back up when I don't and that works for me. Um, you don't need to have a green screen though and, and some computers, it takes more processing power and faster CPUs uh, to be able to use green screen with Zoom and they have those requirements limitations in the Zoom um, support part of their site where they have FAQs and things like that so you can read about minimum requirements for virtual background and for um, uh, virtual background and, and for uh, green screen. But um, you don't have to do that. If you've got a nice bookcase or you've got, you know, Tracy often records videos. If you look at some of the Binge Factor ones, go on um, YouTube and search the Binge Factor or is that your YouTube channel, Tracy, Binge Factor? Do you have a binge factor, no. the binge factor? All right, you can go check that out. And Tracy, a lot of time, just has a corner of her office with an interesting painting on the wall and some, you know, a, a tack board that has, you know, things on it that are related to the business she's doing, but it's professional enough looking. Uh, it's, it's intentional though. And she just has that behind her. And you certainly can do that. You don't need to have a faster processor or a green screen. I like because we do especially now we're doing so many webinars virtual events tracy did a keynote at the utah podcast summit about a month ago or less and you can do a lot more when you have a green screen and and create a different level presentation which would also be helpful for your podcast episodes if you're going to record video anyway just a thought uh let's see any other questions or thoughts Ah. Uh, Let's see. Oh, you gave them the link to, I did a review of a whole bunch of microphones that uh, is in one of our blogs and Tracy put the link in the chat so you can check that out too. I think there's a way we can post the chat links and everything when we um, do the video too. And yeah, we can add it to the description there. So we'll do that. All right. Well, wow. I see there's a decent number of people here uh, still 22 attendees live and we're on more than an hour in. I want to thank you all for staying and, and, you know, for this whole time, I appreciate it. Um, and I hope you got value out of it. And, you know, again, feel free, go to podotize.com, the bottom, uh, three quarters away down the homepage. You can book a call on my calendar. If you want to talk about, um, you know, any of this and, you know, see if podcasting is a good fit for you. If you'd like to 
find a way to get started. Um, or obviously forward slash inquiry takes you directly to the booking calendar. And then don't forget about the do it yourself boot camp. Uh, check that out if that's more to your liking. All right. Well, I think I don't see any more questions. So we're going to wrap it up. Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate your time and I hope everybody's staying healthy and safe.